Hi, everybody. I hope you're seeing me. Uh, I am Mike Sullivan. I'm the external affairs manager here at uh, Skidway Institute of Oceanography. Welcome to our March evening at Skidway program. Uh, it should be very interesting. I uh, listened to the uh, rehearsal we did the other day and, and, and found it absolutely fascinating. First, a couple of uh, uh, housekeeping items. Uh, if you have not already done so, please mute your, uh, your microphone. Uh, and uh, also, if you have, uh, uh, if you are looking at a screen that has, uh, that looks like Hollywood squares, look at your top uh, right uh, of your screen. And if it says, Excuse me, I'm sorry, I was getting a little feedback there. I apologize. Uh, so uh, if you look at the top right of your uh, screen, uh, if it says speaker view, click on that, and then you'll just be able to see uh, myself or, or Natalie, uh, uh, Dr. Cohen, uh, when she's making her, uh, her presentation. Uh, Dr. Cohen, our speaker tonight, uh, is our newest faculty member, joined us officially, came on campus in December. Uh, very exciting young scientist with a broad uh, area of interest, sort of the uh, intersection where uh, uh, marine biology, extension plankton, uh, interact with uh, chemical properties in the ocean. She's gonna get into that a little bit. I would do a longer uh, uh, introduction, except she's gonna do a, a pretty good introduction for herself. So. Uh, at this point, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over. Dr. Natalie Cohen. All righty. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to share my screen now. Give me one moment. All right. Um, so can I get a thumbs up? Can we all see my, my screen on your big screen? Any thumbs? Okay, yep, I see a thumb. All right. Um, well, thank you all so much for joining me tonight. As Mike said, um, I'm Natalie. I'm new around here. Uh, I just joined as a faculty member um, in December, but time flies. Um, and I've been really enjoying getting to know uh, people here on Skinaway Island um, and our counterparts in Athens. Um, so thank you all so much for tuning in. This is gonna be a talk for the general public tonight. I hope you find it interesting. Um, I'm going to start off talking about phytoplankton, um, which is my main research area. I love phytoplankton. I've spent quite some years studying them. Um, and then I'll kind of go into my, uh, my background, my career background, and how I got here at Skidaway um, with you all. Then I'm going to segue from the surface into the deep ocean, and I'm going to talk about hydrothermal vents, these impressive structures, and how they influence the chemistry and the biology of the deep ocean. And then lastly, I'm going to discuss how my research pertains to hydrothermal vent systems. So we're covering a lot of content tonight, and I hope you find it interesting. All right, so we're going to talk about energy sources in the sea surface, um, and that's where phytoplankton have a huge role. And um, later on in today's talk, we're going to talk about energy sources in the deep ocean, and in particular, how hydrothermal vents come into play and how microbes can use chemicals released from vents to create very different food webs um, than we see in the surface ocean. All right, so phytoplankton, let's talk about why they're important. They have a very critical job in the ocean. Um, here they are in our, in our schematic of the ocean. They're responsible for taking up um, CO2 from the atmosphere and converting it into organic carbon. That carbon is then the base of the food web that much of life of the ocean depends upon. So larger plankton will feed on the phytoplankton um, that will support fish all the way up to whales. So um, those phytoplankton, after they're grazed, I'm, I'm going to fail off completely and rejoin. Package. <laughs> I'm going to mute Mike. Um, they get packaged into these fecal cells, um, fecal pellets that can then sink down to deeper layers of the ocean. The phytoplankton themselves can also sink down to deeper layers. So in this way, the phytoplankton are actually moving carbon 
from the atmosphere to the surface of the ocean to the deep ocean. They can actually influence climate over geologic timescales by doing this. The um, facet of phytoplankton that I like to study is where they do and don't have enough nutrients to survive. Just like land plants, phytoplankton need nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, they also need iron. So if they don't get enough iron, they are anemic, just like us. And unfortunately for them, in large regions of the ocean, there's not enough iron for them to grow um, at their maximum potential. So this is a map of our oceans showing dust deposition, and iron tends to be a big component of dust. Um, and there's some regions where a whole lot of dust comes into the surface of the ocean, um, from the Saharan Desert in particular into the Atlantic. Then there's also regions like in the Central and South Pacific where there's not a whole lot of input of iron. Okay, uh, so here is a magnified image of phytoplankton. They're really small. They're smaller than the points of pens in a lot of cases. Um, and they're diverse. They come in a lot of shapes and sizes and they carry out different processes in the ocean. So if anyone is here from the phytoplankton monitoring network, any of the volunteers from Marine Extension, I, I hope we recognize some of these. We see these every week. Um, these are one of my favorites. These are diatoms. These individual cells can link up and form chains. Um, here's another one of my favorites right now. These, these balls, th these are called haptophytes or phaeocystis. Um, they're actually individual cells. All these dots are individual cells that are uh, uh, glued together in a, in a gel-like matrix. They form these balls that can float. Um, so they're definitely beautiful. They're very diverse. And here's a few that I've spent some time studying in general. So these are the diatoms. Um, they, they can be circular like this. They can be long and stick-like. Um, and they're made out of silica, which closely resembles glass. So they can be actually heavy in the water column and important for transferring carbon. They're also really good at growing. So when nutrients are added, um, they tend to grow really quickly. More recently, I've been working with dinoflagellates, which look like this. Again, these are zoomed in images. We have to uh, take these under the microscope. Um, but I really like dinoflagellates. I think of them as jack of all trades because in addition to photosynthesizing, they can actually eat, they can graze. They can also move in three dimensions. So some of these cells have a flagella, which isn't shown here, but it's like a, a tail or a whip-like structure that they can use to move around. And so these plankton can swim, which makes them very cool for phytoplankton. Within these organisms, I'm interested in their RNA and their protein, so molecular components, because they can give us an idea of how these organisms are perceiving and responding to their chemical environment. And ultimately, we care about their growth because it influences these larger processes like the transfer of carbon and energy in our ocean system. So that's my research background in a nutshell as it pertains to the surface ocean. Um, next, I'd like to talk a little bit more about my journey. I always think that's interesting. And Sarah did this last month for us. Um, but basically, how did I get here at Skidaway? Um, I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That's where my parents are, are currently. Um, and I didn't spend too much time at the beaches. Uh, we went to the Jersey Shore over the summers, but um, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't doing any marine science really growing up um, until I went to college. I went to Penn State University and um, I thought I needed to take this class to graduate on time. At one point, someone told me I did. Um, so I, I had to uh, look, uh, try to figure out a way to get there. Um, so I applied and received a scholarship to take this course called um, Tropical Field Ecology, and it, it was in Costa Rica. I hadn't really left the country before that. It was just a two-week class, um, but it was fascinating. Um, got to see some really beautiful parts of Costa Rica, and as a requirement for that class, I had to carry out an independent project. So I decided with a partner to take a look at the abundance of brittle stars. And um, for the fieldwork part of this, we had to actually swim down in this bay and flip rocks to count the brittle stars. And I quickly realized that I couldn't hold my breath for more than about 10 seconds, which made the field work really hard. I was entirely dependent on my partner for all of that. But then I took charge of the synthesis and um, putting our data um, into the context of what else has been known about brittle stars in this area. And I absolutely loved that. So I worked in a few other labs um, during my time as an undergrad. And then I decided I wanted to do some more field work and I wanted to keep working in the marine system. So I 
then moved to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, um, where I carried out my PhD work. And that's when I started working with phytoplankton and how they're able to survive with very uh, low iron availability. And that field work took me um, off the west coast of the US. So I like to think I got better at field work, um, got a little bit more familiar with ship operations. Um, here's a picture of me with one of my fellow grad students and my PhD advisor, Adrian Marchetti. Um, and this is an image from a cruise off the coast of California, one of these regions where there's not a whole lot of iron that the phytoplankton need to grow. And I got to meet uh, a bunch of great people. And that's one of the highlights to me of, of this kind of work, um, those sort of connections that you make over time. So we might recognize some of these people. Um, this one is Dan Onimus, who is here tonight. Um, he's a faculty member in our department. When I first met Dan, it was 2015, and he was a postdoc, and I was very impressed with him. I knew he was going places, and I feel really fortunate that I get to work with him now. Um, and I also want to point out Jeremy Schreier, who was an undergrad at the time, and is now a graduate student in Marianne Rand's lab um, on our Athens campus. So it's been really nice watching people's careers develop. And uh, after my PhD, I decided I wasn't done yet. I wanted to further my studies. And so I became a postdoc um, fellow or scholar at Woods Hole Oceanographic in um, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. If you haven't been there, highly recommend it. Some of the most beautiful beaches I've been on. Um, and I worked with my um, postdoc advisor, Max Saito, who really opened my eyes um, to a lot of different approaches and different organisms and different systems. So I had a great time um, in his lab. In particular, um, I had been working with diatoms up to this point, so a certain kind of phytoplankton. Now I started working with more of the plankton community and across whole sections of the ocean. So I'll show you data today that was collected on this cruise, which actually left from Hawaii and collected water samples um, all the way in, uh, right near the Samoan Islands in the Pacific. This is an image from a cruise I got to be a part of in 2018, 2019, I can't remember, all the years of learning together. Um, but we were actually testing out um, a new robot called Clio, which is huge. It's the size of a refrigerator and it can collect um, seawater samples, samples for us in the water column. Um, and so that was developed by my advisor, Mac, um, and Chip Pryor and Mike Takuba at Woods Hole. Um, and so um, I had uh, these great experiences and that brings me to where I am now um, on Skidaway Island. Uh, and um, here I have a, a number of different projects that I'm, that I'm thinking about and that I'm starting up. I'm really excited to work in our environment right in our backyard. We have this really nice continental shelf gradient. I love to collaborate with some of the researchers here that we have at Skidaway and in Athens, understanding how the phytoplankton change along with the geochemistry of this gradient. Um, I'm also working with Carrie. Um, she's a research technician that's been working with me and we're trying to isolate phytoplankton from our estuaries. This is one that we have that's growing okay. Um, uh, and we, we've been having some fun trying to figure out what kind of seawater media do they like and how do we get them to grow in the lab where we can really control their environment. This is another one I'm interested in. This is a dinoflagellate. And oops, um, most recently, uh, just a week ago, we received cultures from Antarctica, which is a, um, or the Southern Ocean, which surrounds Antarctica, um, which is one of these regions where there's um, not a whole lot of iron available. So we're really excited um, to work with them and I'm excited to start these, these different projects with a number of people. All right, so that was my introduction into photosynthesis um, and my life as a phytoplankton ecologist. Now we're going to shift gears and talk about the deep dark ocean and in particular these structures that are called hydrothermal vents and how they can support life and very different food webs than we see at the surface of the ocean through this process called chemosynthesis. So um, I thought what, what would be fun to do first is just to kind of help you visualize how different the deep ocean is. And I found this, uh, this schematic on divescotty.com, which is a diver's blog, um, and I loved it. Uh, so I wanted to share it with you. Um, and it's showing the, the limits for different organisms and even instruments, how deep they can go in the ocean. So free divers, um, pearl divers, um, they can go to about 40 meters, and to convert from meters to feet, you can roughly multiply by three. 
Um, so, I mean, I can't go that deep. Um, I know when I swim down to the bottom of a pool, I feel that pressure difference and that's the weight of the water on top of you. So as you keep going deeper in the water column, um, you're increasing in pressure. Um, we have this person who actually holds the record um, for free diving down to 250 meters about, which I think is really impressive. We have dolphins and whales that can get to around 270. Um, scuba divers generally go to, can go to over 300, a little over 300. And then if we keep going deeper in the water column, um, people can get down to 700, but they need to be in an at, a one atmosphere suit to handle that pressure difference. And then pilot whales can get to about 1,000. So we're not done yet. The ocean is really deep. Um, after about 1,000 meters, that's when light no longer can penetrate. Um, and so the ocean gets pretty dark. Um, this is called the aphotic ocean for the absence of light. So phytoplankton can't grow down here because there's no light. They can sink, organic material can sink down from the surface for sure, but cells that need light can't carry out photosynthesis. Organisms that do survive down here, like the leatherback turtles and the squids, they have to have adaptations that allow them to handle that pressure difference. So just keep that in mind as we're going deeper. Um, so here we have whales, we have the southern elephant seal, here we have a sperm whale, which can get to 3,000. Okay, we're still going down. Um, so the average ocean depth is 4,000 meters or four kilometers, and the data I'll show you today is from a little deeper than that, between four and 5,000 meters. Um, the Titanic sank to, um, to 3,800 meters. And when it was discovered, scientists um, uncovered a whole bunch of new species and even microbes that were surviving using rust. There are places where the ocean is deeper um, and that, that typically occurs, um, that only occurs in, in trenches. Um, we'll talk about trenches and plate tectonics more in just a moment, but these are cavities where the ocean uh, is quite a bit deeper. Um, and so scientists found um, a snailfish it's called the Mariana snailfish. They were pretty surprised to see an organism all the way down there, again, because of the pressure. Um, I, I, I like this blog post. They described that pressure um, to be an elephant standing on a thumb. So these organisms have to be able to handle that. And then we sent um, instrumentation and robots down to the deepest part of the Mariana Trench, which is, which is about 11,000 meters or 36,000 feet. So I hope that gives you an idea for how different the ecosystem is down here, mainly where we'll be talking about today. Um, it's high pressure, it's dark, it's also cold. The average temperature of the deep ocean is about two to four degrees Celsius. So that's about the temperature of a refrigerator. So way different from surface conditions. Okay, um, so now let's talk about these hydrothermal vents and where they occur. So hydrothermal activity is associated um, with plate boundaries. And that's what this map of our ocean is showing us, different plate boundaries. We need to briefly review the theory of plate tectonics. Um, and this explains the structure of the Earth's crust. Um, and it's responsible for phenomena that we see on the surface, such as volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. As a theory, it was only really accepted by scientists in the 60s, so not that long ago. We were still understanding these foundational concepts about our planet. So um, the theory of plate tectonics is reviewed in this figure. Um, here we're looking at a cross section of the deep ocean and the interior of our planet. So here's the deep ocean. Here is our sea floor and our thin slab of oceanic crust. It sits on top of our liquid mantle, and then this is the interior of our planet. The liquid mantle forms these convection cells, there's movement, and that actually causes our oceanic plates to move. There are regions where this magma is rising and it's beating the seafloor, and spreading is actually occurring. These plates are moving away from each other and new oceanic crust is being generated here. So there's hydrothermal vents associated with that process. There's also regions where oceanic crust is being destroyed, and this is called um, a subducting plate. This forms those trenches, those deepest parts of the oceans that we mentioned earlier. So when scientists dated oceanic crust, they realized it was only 200 million years old, which isn't that old. Our planet is thought to be 4.5 billion years old. That was perplexing, but now we know it's because um, our oceanic crust is being created and destroyed. Okay, so let's go back to our uh, map of plate boundaries. 
Here in these squares, these are regions where plates are actually spreading away from each other. So new crust is being created. Um, and these are known hydrothermal events that are associated with, um, with the spreading. Um, by the way, we're, we're continuing to discover new hydrothermal events every time, uh, most times we go down and visit. So this is by no means, these dots are by no means exhaustive. There's also regions where subduction is occurring, and that's shown here with these triangles. This is where one plate is subducting underneath another. I'm going to talk about my research a little bit later, and um, that's focused on the Lao Basin, this area of the Pacific. This is an interesting location because um, it's called a back arc basin, both spreading and subducting is occurring in this concentrated area, and it produces a lot of hydrothermal activity. Okay, now we have a cross section of a hydrothermal vent. So these are structures that are sitting on the seafloor associated with um, spreading and subducting of our oceanic plates. Um, here we have magma that's really hot, that's rising to meet the seafloor. Um, and again, this vent is sitting on a mid-ocean ridge in this case. Um, and we have seawater, cold seawater that's percolating in through cracks and interacting with this hot rock. And then it's spewing out of these vents. So this is a hydrothermal vent. It gets its name because there's this venting hot fluid coming out of this structure. So in this, um, in this fluid, there's gases, there's also metals, and um, they're precipitating and they're forming the walls of these chimney structures. Now in a process that we'll talk more about in just a moment called chemosynthesis, microbes are able to use these chemicals and convert it into a form of energy, and they can actually be the base of a very um, uh, productive, dense food web on the bottom of the ocean. So why do hydrothermal vents matter? Well, for a number of reasons, but I'll tell you why they matter a lot to me. Um, hydrothermal vents can release iron. We talked about how important iron is as a nutrient to surface phytoplankton. So in places like the Southern Ocean, one of those regions where there's not a whole lot of iron, these hydrothermal vents have been shown to trigger these massive blooms. And so this paper only came out um, a few weeks ago. Um, and so I find them very interesting and they're very important even for surface phytoplankton, depending on where those vents sit in the water column and where, how that water moves. Hydrothermal vents are also important because there's ongoing discussions by organizations and governments to mine, deep sea mine um, rocks at the bottom of the ocean near these hydrothermal vents to meet our increasing economic demands. There's rocks called manganese nodules that are rich in um, metals that are actually valuable. And then the chimneys themselves, the hydrothermal vents themselves are made out of these minerals. Um, and so if, if any of you are familiar with Tesla, the car company, they were using cobalt in their batteries for some time, but they're switching away from it because it's um, expensive to get and it's often mined unethically. And so those are the kind of metals that are in these manganese nodule rocks that are deep in the ocean, metals like cobalt and nickel. And so what this looks like is a ship would go out into the middle of the Pacific, essentially deploying a very large vacuum cleaner, and it would suck up these rocks and uh, probably destroy a whole lot of benthic habitat in the process. So in order to understand how the ecosystem may be disrupted by that, it's important to establish a baseline and understand how that ecosystem operates currently. Okay. Um, so now what I'm going to do is show you um, a video um, that was um, uploaded by Nautilus Live. Um, they explore the ocean. There's a ton of really great videos of hydrothermal vents, um, but I picked this one because um, I, I really liked it. And hopefully this gives you an idea of what these structures look like. Um, so as I play it, I'm going to narrate it as best that I can, um, but just sit back and enjoy the, the beautiful imagery. So I'm going to stop sharing so I can share my YouTube screen. All right, um, can I get a few thumbs up for uh, if you can see my YouTube screen? Are there any thumbs? I see a thumb, all right, thank you. Okay, so I'll make this bigger and I'll play. 
Okay, so these are hydrothermal vents. Um, these impressive structures can be over four stories tall. Um, before scientists went down in the late 70s, they had no idea that these existed. So you can imagine how shocked they were to see these and the life that they were supporting. We need um, submersibles and robots that can withstand right, the, the high pressure um, and temperature conditions to be able to sample these. So this vent um, and many of these vents, you'll see them releasing um, fluid. The fluid can be different colors depending on what's coming out of it. All those bubbles are gases. So there's gases like H2, methane, CO2, and sulfide is a big one. Sulfide um, has, is that rotten egg smell, or if you've ever been at a marsh at low tide, it's that same smell. Um, the sulfide interacts with metals and it, it forms these minerals that precipitate out of, the, out of the water column and form the chimney structure itself. It's hot, it looks hot. Um, when scientists first tried to take the temperature of the fluid, it broke their sensors because they were not expecting the temperature to be 400 degrees Celsius, which is how hot some of these can run. Um, so if you cook in your kitchen and you boil water, that's 100 degrees Celsius. This is four times that. The reason it can stay in solution and not instantly evaporate is because of the high pressure down there. So this um, robot is sampling um, this hydrothermal vent. And so uh, th this is a great image. This um, hydrothermal vent chimney is covered in shrimp. It's a lot of shrimp. So scientists were shocked to see intertidal organisms like um, shrimp and, and crabs and clams down here. Um, and they later realized that um, their food source was microbes that were extracting chemicals out of the vent fluid and converting it into organic material. Um, the, the vents do differ in age. Some are younger, some have been skewing for quite some time. And that will affect um, how uh, colonized the, the chimney is, so how many microbes are present, how dense those microbial mats are. Um, the older ones tend to support um, much more dense animal communities. This is a, this is a very beautiful one um, and very impressive. Um, this is uh, blowing out this black fluid. It's how it gets its name as a black smoker. It's not actually smoke, it's the hydrogen sulfide and metals. Um, and so we're looking very close up and personal at these vents, but you can imagine that the, that fluid that's being released, it's mixing with surrounding seawater. And so just keep in mind the temperature difference here. The deep ocean is about two to four degrees Celsius, so it's pretty cold. And then this vent fluid is, in this case, about 150 degrees Celsius up to 400 degrees Celsius. So talk about a temperature change. And the organisms that live down there have to be able to handle this temperature gradient. Um, and here we have some shellfish, again, entirely surviving um, based on chemosynthetic bacteria. So very different from the type of clams that we see in the surface. Here we have more of that billowing um, fluid, in this case, black for the hydrogen sulfide. All right, um, and so there's a lot of videos. I mean, it's hard to choose between them all. Um, if you're interested, I highly recommend um, checking a few more of them out. I will show one more um, a little bit later um, that I enjoyed. Here are two worms. These were first discovered at hydrothermal vents. We didn't know that these sort of structures, uh, organisms existed otherwise. They can be quite tall. Um, again, surviving completely based off of their chemosynthetic um, bacteria that live within their tissues. So I'm gonna stop the video here and I'm gonna go back to the presentation. All right. Okay, so um, we talked a bit now about chemosynthesis. So let's review that process in a little bit more detail. Um, so chemosynthesis allows for life independent of life. So keep in mind when scientists went down here to the bottom of the ocean in the 70s, we didn't know that there could be life independent of light in the darkness. Um, now we know that there can. Um, so here is a schematic showing what this process might look like. We have microbes that live within the tissues of organisms like the mussels or the tube worms. They can also be living on the vent itself um, or in um, the seawater. 
And what they're doing is they're taking up CO2 and carbon dioxide um, from the seawater itself. They're then taking in hydrogen sulfide that's released from the vent, and they're converting that into a source of um, sugar. Um, they're also releasing sulfur compounds as byproducts that they don't need, and other organisms can then use those sulfur compounds for their metabolism. So the microbes doing this then transfer that sugar to their animal host, in this case a mussel, but again, could be a tuber. So this process looks a whole lot like photosynthesis actually. Um, photosynthesis starts off with CO2 and water, and then it uses solar energy instead of hydrogen sulfide to produce a form of sugar like glucose. And oxygen is the byproduct, which is great for us, all of, our, all of us oxygen breathers. Um, so that's, this is one form of chemosynthesis called sulfide oxidation. There's actually a number of other types of chemosynthesis that we know about now. There's energy to be gained using resources that are released from the vent fluid like methane and H2 and iron and manganese. And through chemosynthesis, these hydrothermal vents can host entire ecosystems. Um, the colors of the micro microbes and the mats that they produce change depending on which organism is present. And that depends on um, what's, what's coming out of the vents, what's available to be used by these microbes. Uh, and these are some of the larger animals that can be supported, like shrimp. We saw the shrimp, um, octopus, stars, um, organisms that are, are surviving on these hotspots um, based on chemosynthesis as the base of this food bug. So now I'm going to show you one more video. Um, it's going to be narrated by Shannon Johnson, who's a researcher at Ambari. She's actually worked with the vehicles that have gone down um, to these vents, and she'll explain a little bit more about the really cool animals that are down there. So this is about a four minute video, and then we'll come back. descends, we start to see this plume of black smoke. And we're like, yes, we found it. And then this huge chimney comes into view. And it's just packed with giant tube worms. Everybody was out of their seats in the control room taking pictures of the screens with our phones. We looked like a bunch of tourists. <laughs> we were. <laughs> My name is Shannon Johnson, and I'm a research technician in Abari, and I'm one of the few people in the world who's been lucky enough to visit many of the most beautiful hydrothermal vents around the world. Hydrothermal vents are probably one of the most extreme places on Earth to live. It's basically an underwater volcano we would definitely melt apart if we were down in this area. And yet they're inhabited by these amazing creatures. Vents are very special places in the ocean. They act like these little island oases of food for animals because a lot of the bottom of the ocean is just mud. There's no sun. There's no light at all. It's completely pitch black. And these animals that are living on hydrothermal vents, they're completely reliant on this system called chemosynthesis, where bacteria are being fed by minerals coming out of the bottom of the ocean rather than sunlight coming down from the sky. And all the animals at hydrothermal vents are reliant on the bacteria for nutrition. Riftia pachyptala are these giant tube worms, and they're kind of the poster child of hydrothermal vents. They're often four feet tall, so they're very imposing figures in the deep sea. They have no mouth, no gut, and instead they have this beautiful red plume that they use for gas exchange. That's their gills. They pull minerals out of the water and deliver those to bacteria inside of their bodies, and the bacteria feed the worms. Zawarsa fishes are these really cool fishes that live in and amongst the Riftia tube worms. 
Zeriftia are not bothered at all by the Zoarcids because the Zoarcids just help clean them and keep the parasites and things off of them, like the clownfish helps the anemone. Alvanella pompeana are the coolest little worms. They look like little fuzzy wuzzy stuffed animals. They have a fleece-like coating of bacteria that helps protect them from some of the hottest water that comes out of the vents. They extend their gills out into much cooler water and they do this little dance in between the cooler water and the hotter water in and out of their tubes so that they can go into the hot part and extract minerals from the vents and then go back out to the cooler water and extract oxygen out of the water. So they're like hot, 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 cool, cool, cool. <laughs> There's nowhere else really like it on Earth where you have these amazing creatures that live right up close to these really extreme environments. Every time we go to sea, we learn new things and find new discoveries, new species, new places, and it's so important to keep going back out there and doing exploration and discovery. Okay, I hope everyone can see my screen now. All right, um, so um, Shannon gave us a little bit of an idea of the types of animals that are down there and how impressive they are. So now the last point I wanna make about hydrothermal vents is an interesting one. Um, it could be the place where life originally evolved. Here's a really beautiful mural that I found um, online that was digitally painted by these two artists. And it encompasses some of the concepts involved in the origin of life. So places where it could have happened, really getting at this question of how do we go from chemicals to organic molecules all the way to a cell that can then replicate. So let's attack some of what, what we know. Um, all life that we, know, that we know of, so us to fish to microbes, we all have the same basic building blocks. So we all have DNA, that's our genetic blueprint, that's the roadmap that tells cells how to make more cells. We have proteins, they carry out important reactions. Um, carbohydrates, those are sugars, and fatty acids, those are a way to store sugars. Um, so we can um, trace current forms of life um, back to the common ancestor. That's by looking at our, our DNA sequences. Um, we can see the similarity. And so we seem to have come from an original ancestor, this original cell. Um, it was primitive, so probably bacterial uh, or, or more like the bacterial cells we have currently. And that likely paved the way for more complex cells and then multicellular life like us and allow for organisms to get bigger. It happened a very long time ago. Um, the, early evidence, the earliest evidence that we have for life is about three and a half billion years ago. And that's where we see um, fossilized bacteria in the rock record. It could, have have, it could have originated earlier than that, but that's our earliest um, evidence for it. And if it evolved here, could it have evolved on other planets? That's the multi-billion dollar question. Could it have evolved on um, a moon of Jupiter, for instance? And hydrothermal vents seem to resemble um, conditions of early Earth. So they are thought as a candidate location for where that original cell um, came to be. So let's go through um, the requirements that, that scientists um, consider um, necessary in order for cells to evolve, to go from inorganic chemicals to then organic molecules. We need water. Um, we are 60% water, so water seems to be necessary for life. We need large temperature gradients um, for the heating and cooling of this reaction process. Uh, we definitely have that in hydrothermal vents. We need reduced chemical species um, like H2 and CO2 and ammonium. Um, work done by several of these scientists has shown that using those reduced chemicals, you can actually get organic molecules. Metals are important. Metals are used as catalysts. They help speed up reactions that would otherwise be way too slow and not likely to occur. 
And mineral surfaces are important. So even if you can make these organic molecules, they'd be really dilute in seawater. Um, we need a way to make those molecules stick and concentrate them. And so mineral surfaces uh, would be very useful for that. There's definitely a lot of minerals at hydrothermal vents. And then of course we need mixing to mix all these chemicals up. And we have that. So the, the conclusion here is that organic molecules can be created by mixing hot, reduced hydrothermal fluid with seawater. Um, did life evolve at hydrothermal vents? The jury is still out on that one. Okay, and so next I'd like to segue um, into my own research. Now that we know what hydrothermal vents are, I wanted to share a little bit about um, why I've been studying them. And so my research questions are, um, are there metals associated with a hydrothermal plume in the Pacific Ocean, a particular one that, that's in the Lao Basin, and I, I'll point out that region again just shortly. And can the chemicals released from this, um, this hydrothermal vent influence microbes and their metabolism? This is work that I carried out as a postdoc at um, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and here's uh, my colleagues that, that helped make this work possible. So in order to, to get at my research, there's just one more um, piece of background knowledge that I need to share with you. Up until this point, we've been focusing on hydrothermal vents up close and personal. We're looking at the vents and we're seeing that fluid billow out of the chimneys. So that is called a near field study. Um, and there's, lot, there's been um, more work done on the near field studies than the far field studies. So these plumes, um, they tend to rise in the water column up until a point where they reach neutral density, and then they start to spread laterally. So they can actually move substantial distances away from the vent source, all the while bringing along with them chemicals that are mixing with surrounding seawater. So I'm going to talk about a, what's called a distal plume. It's a far field plume that has moved away from that original vent source. It was thought originally that most of the metals that are released from hydrothermal vents will precipitate and sink out of the water column pretty quickly, right? They form that, that um, chimney structure um, made out of minerals. Um, but it's been shown recently that that's not true. Uh, metals can actually move appreciable distances away. So we'll take a look at that next. This was shown just a few years ago um, in 2015 um, in the Pacific Ocean. So here we're looking at the coast of Peru and this scientific crew, they sampled all along um, this transect. This right here is mid-ocean ridge spreading center. So a region where the oceanic crust is moving away from each other and new crust is being generated. And they sampled all the way um, to Tahiti, roughly around Tahiti in the South Pacific. They measured um, helium-3. Helium-3 is a marker for hydrothermal activity because it's released from the mantle. So when we see it in the ocean, we know that there's hydrothermal activity happening. And it's been known for some time um, that we can actually see that signature in the water column. So let me just set you up with this map. The, you're looking at a section of the Pacific now from Peru um, all the way out to roughly where Tahiti is. And this is depth in the water column. So this would be the bottom of the ocean here, about 5,000 meters, four to 5,000. And the color is helium-3. So it's been known for some time that that helium-3 can actually be detected um, thousands of kilometers away from the vent site. But it wasn't known that iron and manganese could also be detected and can move away over 4,000 kilometers um, from that vent source. So that's pretty shocking and interesting because iron can be a hard resource to come by in uh, regions of the South Pacific. So now I'm gonna take a look at um, a hydrothermal vent in the South Pacific. And here I'm showing you chlorophyll concentration derived from satellites. So Sarah set us up um, with this last month. Um, chlorophyll A is a proxy for phytoplankton biomass. And the data that I'm gonna show you um, was collected along this gradient. Um, we started off in um, what's called a ligotrophic water. So it's very low nutrients and so very low chlorophyll. We then crossed the equator, which tends to be a bit more productive because of upwelling of deep water. And then we went into the South Pacific. So the South Pacific has some of the lowest chlor chlorophyll A, right? It's the only purple that we see on this map. That's because um, nitrogen and phosphorus is in low supply, but um, it, iron is also not easy to come by. 
So I should say in this area, hydrothermal vents could be really important as a source of iron to the, these communities. Here's our plate boundaries map that we saw earlier. And I just wanna put my research site in context. So this is the Lao Basin. It's a back arc spreading center. There's both spreading and subduction happening here. And so it produces a lot of hydrothermal activity. So my question is, are there metals associated with a hydrothermal vent in uh, the Northeast Lao Basin? And I'm gonna set you up um, with this section map here. We're looking at helium-3 concentrations again in the color scale. This is um, the Pacific Ocean going west. And here we have depth in the water column. So here's that helium signature that we were just looking at in the, um, in the Pacific. We see that move across um, thousands of kilometers west. There's another helium signature, a uh, bit shallower in the water column, and it's called the Tonga Fiji plume. It's right near the Samoan Islands. And so this is the one I wanted to investigate. Are there metals associated with this plume and moving away from the vent source the way that we've seen um, further east? Here is my transect. Now I'm giving you a zoomed in look at it. Um, I wasn't actually on this cruise. Um, it happened before I joined my lab, um, but they departed from Hawaii and then they sailed um, to the Samoan Islands. My second question that I want to address is, um, if there are metals uh, or chemicals associated with this hydrothermal plume, how might they be influencing microbial metabolism? Uh, so um, we wanted to quantify trace metals in seawater. Um, it's no easy feat, and it's because trace metals are in very low concentrations in seawater to begin with. Um, so they're hard to measure. So seawater is 96.5% water and only 3.5% salt. If we take a look at the salt fraction, most of it is sodium and chloride, which is table salt, and the small sliver, 0.7% of the 3%, that's the minor constituents that include iron. So they're hard to measure. Um, on this cruise, they used um, ocean instrumentation to collect seawater from different depths. And so this is what we call a trace metal rosette. Um, it is able to hang these bottles on them. They're called Niskin bottles, and they can collect seawater for us at different depths in the water column, going all the way down to the bottom. So a lot of care has to be taken um, to not contaminate our samples. Uh, so these types of um, instrumentation are designed with as little metal as possible. But then you as the user also have to be careful. Um, so sometimes we joke that you can't look at a sample funny because then it might get contaminated because they're just very easily contaminated with metals like iron and, and zinc. Um, so we then brought these to Day, I wasn't on the cruise, scientists brought these samples um, back to the lab and then I concentrated them. So I took them from a larger volume to a smaller one so that we could actually measure these metals and then quantified them um, using mass spectrometry. And so I'll share some of that data with you now. Here is a, a really nice zoomed in look at my section map, except now I'm showing you the bathymetry or the underlying um, uh, bottom of the seafloor. Um, here's my different stations uh, that I'll show you in just a minute with these yellow X's. And here's a trench. So this is where one plate is subducting under another one. And um, a lot of these uh, black lines, these are actually spreading centers. So places where the um, crust is, is being created. And all of these green stars, these are uh, different known hydrothermal vents. There's over 135 in the Northeast Lao Basin alone. So there's a lot of hydrothermal vent activity out here. Now I wanna show you what metals in seawater usually looks like. So this is our um, background site. It would be Station 8, which is roughly up here. Um, and this is what we understand the South Pacific to, to generally look like. Um, we have iron concentrations shown here on the x-axis, iron is in red, and then I have manganese concentrations here in blue. And y-axis is depth in the water column, again going down to, I'll show you data down a little over 4,000 meters. Black is oxygen, let's just ignore oxygen for now. So typically in the water column, iron is really low on the surface, um, in some cases undetectable, and that's because phytoplankton have drawn it down. As we go deeper in the water column, there tends to be a little bit more iron due to bacteria um, turning over nutrients. 
And then as we keep going down, it, 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 um, it decreases a little bit due to um, iron sinking out of the water column. Manganese looks very different, it looks the opposite. It tends to be higher in the surface because it's brought in with aerosols and then it uh, very rapidly precipitates out of seawater. And so it gets quite low in the deep ocean. So now let's contrast that with what we found at station 13, which was directly above a spreading center. Um, so we have again, manganese in blue, iron in red, um, reaching much higher concentrations. So steadily increasing to 12 nanomolar for manganese and six for iron. Um, so not, not what we would have expected at a background site. And this appears to be um, uh, an influence of this hydrothermal vent activity. I should mention that we um, had a temperature sensor down here and it was the temperature of seawater. So we didn't, we're not seeing hot fluid. So th that's why we think this is a distal dispersing plume. We're not very close to the vent source anymore, but it still has this memory of the chemical signature that was released from the hydrothermal vent. So we have this metal maximum at around 1900 meters. Um, and if we keep going to the east, I'm just showing you a couple other stations and without going into too much detail here, um, we see a number of peaks um, at these sites um, in different phases of the metals that seem to be consistent with multiple hydrothermal plumes. Um, and we seem to be capturing all of those influencing our metal profile, which makes sense because there's many sources here in the Northeast Lao Basin. My next question is how might the microbes be influenced by the plume geochemistry? And so recall we're in our distal plume now away from the vent source. We were, and I'm gonna compare these proteins to what I was seeing in background seawater. So um, with that comparison in mind, I'm seeing indications of chemosynthesis through sulfide oxidation. Um, I'm seeing uh, metal transporters that sit on the cell wall and can help metals go in and out of cells. Um, could be good if metals are too low, but also if metals are too high, they have a mechanism for getting rid of metals. Um, proteins are being broken down by some bacteria. And I'm also seeing proteins that are being used um, as structural support for the cells. We know under high temperature, high pressure conditions, protein misfolding can happen. Um, and so it, it seems um, wise to have a way to protect the integrity of cells um, in, in this region. So that's a bit of the, of the um, metabolism that we were able to detect using proteins. And um, the last point I wanted to make um, is, is an interesting one. Um, we talked about how the deep ocean is dark, and it is dark for the most part. Um, but I was seeing uh, chlorophyll and photosynthesis related proteins from phytoplankton that have sank to the bottom of the ocean. Now, it's not rare to see that. I mean, we're gonna catch some sinking material in this analysis, but there seems to have been more of it at this site than there was at my other background sites. Um, and that was perplexing. Um, and I, I spoke to one of my collaborators who pointed me to this paper that came out in 2005, and it um, documented these green sulfur bacteria that live at hydrothermal vents, but they actually need um, a low amount of light to grow. The amount of light that they need is equivalent to about 80 meters in the Black Sea, so not a whole lot. And um, these researchers hypothesized that um, geothermal radiation, so light emitted in the infrared range of the light spectrum, could actually be how these organisms are surviving and getting their really low amounts of light. So this is an image that was um, alert. Jay Brandes forwarded this to me, um, which I missed. It was a paper that came out in 1994. They actually took an image of a chimney. So this is a hydrothermal vent up pretty close. And they turned all the lights off of the submersible and they actually saw this, this glow. Um, so one idea I have is maybe we're seeing these photosynthetic proteins because they're being biochemically stimulated by some of the light that's down there. Um, and Interestingly, um, these authors uh, bring up the, the possibility that cells that maybe those early cells that were chemosynthetic evolved the ability to use geothermal light. And then maybe they seeded life as we know it at the surface of the ocean using solar radiation. So um, definitely interesting to think about. Um, and there's a lot of researchers working on, on that now. 
Okay, so I hope you all learned something today. I hope you enjoyed um, hearing about hydrothermal vents and the unique chemistry and biology that they support in the deep ocean. Um, we talked about how hydrothermal vents occur in regions where that hot magma is rising towards the sea floor. It causes intense chemical transformations to, to take place. Um, they can support chemosynthetic growth and actually dense food webs that look way different from the food webs at the surface of the ocean. Maybe they're the site where life originally evolved. And then we talked about my own research um, about how trace metals are associated with hydrothermal distal plumes in the Lao Basin of the South Pacific and how we can actually detect indications of their altered metabolism um, in, in plume influence seawater. Uh, so the last point I wanted to make is if you liked this talk, it was inspired um, by concepts that I read about in this book called How to Build a Habitable Planet by Charles Langmuir and Molly Broker. Um, it's a great book. It's written for a general audience. Um, definitely inspired me when it came to plate tectonics and the origin of life. So I just wanted to plug it. Um, and thank you all so much for tuning in this evening. Um, and uh, I'll take questions if you have any. Great, uh, Natalie, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first off, a quick apology to our uh, YouTube viewers. Uh, if you are watching us on Zoom, you can use the live chat uh, to type in questions and I'll, I will uh, pick those up and relay them uh, to Natalie. Uh, if you are on YouTube, we discovered that uh, when we set this uh, live stream up, we set a setting that it was appropriate for children. And when you do that, it eliminates live chat. So instead, we quickly have somebody uh, who is going to, come on. Well, it's not working. I, maybe. Um, so um, Dan just forwarded me this link. If you are on YouTube, you can type this link um, in and then submit your question that way yeah. and we'll be happy to answer it. Well, I am trying to put a link up on the screen and I don't believe it is working for me. And I sor I'm sorry about that. Uh, anybody on Zoom who would like to uh, ask a question? Uh, here's one. It says, uh, how do colors show in such dark water? Um, okay, I'm going to have to stop sharing. Um, how do the colors show in such dark water? Um, submersibles have lights on them, so they're able to shine the lights, and that's how we get that, that great imagery, right? Because that's a good question. Otherwise, it'd be pretty dark down there. One other person asked, wasn't sure I caught one of those last points. Did you say there was radiation that was causing the light in those depths? Um, yes, yeah, so there's infrared light. Um, it's the infrared part of the light spectrum. Um, and that's also called geothermal radiation. Did you say the plates were spreading and ducting? They are spreading and subducting. Yep, subducting is on one plate goes under another one. Yep. Other questions? Well, I want to thank everybody. Our we have a. I would also like to uh, announce that we have a uh, a special. Uh, Evening at Skid Away program special two weeks from tonight. Uh, we had, uh, this was a sort of a drop in. It should be very interesting. Uh, uh, Dr. Chris Marse, uh, a year ago at this time, was uh, sitting on an icebreaker, locked in the, in the polar ice cap, and not able, to get, not able to get back because of the COVID pandemic. And his program is uh, going to talk about. Uh, his experience uh, spending four months uh, on an icebreaker, a German icebreaker, doing Arctic research on climate change. 
uh, locked in the, uh, uh, into the polar ice cap. And uh, what he went through, it should be, uh, uh, it should be very, very interesting. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, let's say one thing. Oh, we have one more question here. Uh, there is bioluminescence on animals in the sea. Can photosynthetic organisms use that to make sugar? It's a really good question. Um, in short, I am not sure, but I think that the bioluminescence light wouldn't be strong enough to support photosynthesis. Um, and it also seems to be sporadic depending on where an organism is at the time. So that doesn't seem to be a steady source of light the same way that the geothermal radiation would be, but it's a good question and I'm not sure. And you know, another question, what other types of metals are found near the vents? Is it mostly iron and magnesium? Iron and manganese, which is different from magnesium, um, but uh, there are other metals as well and magnesium. Um, let's see, there's uh, zinc. I, I've seen that one in my data set. Um, copper, which I didn't really see in my data set too much of that. Um, aluminum um, and lead, just to name a few others. How does this help the earth to be more habitable? Um, okay, so uh, the resources that are emitted from those hydrothermal vents, those inorganic resources like um, CO2 and ammonium, those are, the, those are um, basic uh, building blocks that seem to be necessary to create organic molecules. That's been done in the lab. So we think those are the starting point that can lead to um, life and to a habitable planet. But you should totally read that book, How to Build a Habitable Planet. Analogs of hydrothermal vents on other planets. Might need Clark to answer this one. There definitely are analogs um, of extreme um, ecosystems or extreme environments. Um, and uh, I have a friend who likes to study um, deep sea extreme locations. And um, now she's uh, working for NASA actually. Um, and so yes, there are researchers that study hydrothermal vents as these analogs of extreme in environments. Ice ocean moons are likely to have um, comparable systems somewhere uh, in their depths. Is there a possibility that the average chlorophyll is a result of iron reaching the surface and causing phytoplankton blooms? Yeah, I mean, that definitely does happen, right? That causes those massive phytoplankton blooms and that can trigger um, more organic sinking down to the water column. Um, but what we found interesting is that that um, couldn't be happening at our site given that the iron concentrations were so low at the surface, there, there was no evidence of a huge bloom there. And we just found it interesting that we see those chlorophyll related, photosynthesis related proteins at this site and not at our other deep sites. Does that make sense? Um, all right. Well, I really appreciated all the questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, and I, I hope to see you next month. All right. Have a good evening. Bye. And there is, if you're still around, there's the information on Dr. Marseille's uh, talk uh, in two weeks, two weeks from today.
Good night, everyone.